You are listening to the Thoughts from a Page podcast, which is a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network. My name is Cindy Burnett, and I love to talk about books with anyone and everyone. While listening to my podcast, you will hear author interviews, behind-the-scenes conversations about various aspects of the publishing world, theme discussions with other book lovers, and more. For more book recommendations and a complete list of all of my interviews, check out my website, thoughtsfromapage.com, and follow me on Facebook and Instagram at Thoughts from a Page. In 2022, I would really love for you to join my Patreon group. I offer at least three bonus episodes a month. There is a Facebook group where we all discuss books, and we are currently reading two advanced copies of books and chatting with the authors pre-publication. I will be offering two more of these pre-pub chats soon as well. Thanks to those that already participate, and I hope you will consider joining us. Today, I am conversing with Louise Candlish about The Heights. Louise is the international best-selling author of 15 novels. Our House, a number one bestseller, won the Crime and Thriller Book of the Year at the 2019 British Book Awards. It is now a major ITV drama starring Martin Comston, Tuppence Middleton, and Rupert Penry Jones. The Heights is also in development for TV. Louise lives in London with her husband and her daughter. The Heights is a fantastic thriller, and I hope you enjoy listening to our conversation about it as much as I enjoyed chatting with Louise. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my health and energy levels. That is because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all of my family and friends because the company has a team of doctors and scientists. It is tested for 950 contaminants and is NSF certified for sport. It is formulated based on the latest science and it maintains high quality standards. Thanks AG1 for sponsoring my show. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you wanna take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. And now back to my show. Welcome, Louise. How are you today? Really well, thank you. All the better for chatting to you, Cindy. Well, I feel the same way. I am a huge fan of your work. I loved Our House. And then The Heights literally kept me on the edge of my chair until I finished the book. I sat down, did not stop reading pretty much until I finished it, except to get up and get a drink of water and those kinds of things. It is so good. Thank you so much. And I'm really actually intrigued to know how long it takes to read a book of mine in one sitting, because I guess it must be a bit like listening to the audiobook. Is it about six hours or something? That's what I would have said, probably between five and six hours. I mean, I did get up, you know, every once in a while to grab a (laughs) snack and things like that, but I pretty much read it in a day. So it was so good. So many great twists and turns. And of course, we'll be spoiler free, but I still have some good questions about it all. Oh, well, thank you so much. That really is sort of the ultimate compliment, I think. I always say if you start a book in daylight and when you look up, the room has sort of darkened around you. That is the sign of a, you know, compulsive read and, um, you know, sort of nailing it in one one shift, taking the day off work or, you know, sort of staying up all night. It's just um, they're all the ultimate compliments for for us authors. Uh, Well, before we dive into my other questions, why don't we just talk a little bit about The Heights? For those that won't have read it yet, can you give me a quick synopsis? Yes, absolutely. It's a it's a psychological thriller and a kind of family revenge story, I would say. And for those who read my previous book, The Other Passenger, it's it's very much a kind of reaction against that because I tend to, to do something a little bit different each time. Some of your listeners won't know that this is actually my 15th novel. So I'm always looking to try new structures um, and, and explore new themes. So The Other Passenger was a very kind of bleak tale of child-free couples and envy and avarice and adultery, um, and you know, just huge fun to write, and just you know, a real joy to get into those kind of black-hearted voices. But afterwards, I felt like I wanted to ground myself in something with a kind of family theme, 
And so, um, and I'd also been wanting to write about revenge for a long time. I'd never really been able to sort of nail a good, good plot um, or hook to, you know, to get the revenge story underway. And so, you know, I thought about it for quite a while before I came up with a feud, a family feud that I felt was was something that I hadn't read about um, or seen on the screen very much, which is the rivalry between a, a very, you know, devoted, if not neurotic mum of a teenage boy and his best friend who she perceives as a terrible influence. And so that's very much at the heart of the, the story. When we plow into the past, Ellen, the heroine, is you know almost in love with her her son Lucas. He's a golden boy, and you know she has high hopes for his future. And she's always been a very very protective mom, you know, a helicopter mom, um, a momager, all of those labels that have sprung up. But the moment this new influence comes into his life through school, Kieran, everything changes, and before long, there's a there's a terrible tragedy. So yeah, that's that's where I started with the book, and then I began to construct as I tend to do, a more sort of complicated uh, narrative structure around it to make it more of a puzzle for the reader and to, to try and make it a bit more interesting. Because as, as I say, I'm always trying to do something new to, you know, to intrigue and, and entertain. And so in this case, we enter the narrative through Ellen's memoir. She's in a sort of um, victims of crime writing class and getting tips on on how to put together her story from this um, tutor called Felix Penny. I really liked the format. That was one of the things that appealed to me so much about the book initially. And I felt like it worked so well to kind of toggle back and forth between her memoir and the person who's writing the story for the news. I thought that worked so well. Thank you so much. And yes, so um, you mentioned the person writing the story for the news when Ellen's first attempt at writing a memoir is so successful that she is published. And so we we have this kind of framework to the the book in the voice of a Sunday Times journalist. And this journalist is, you know, perhaps not as won over by Ellen as Ellen would have liked. And interestingly, I voiced the Saki journalist in the audio book. So... (laughs) Obviously, my publisher felt that that was the um, that was the the voice that had I had the most in common with, so that made me laugh. But um, yeah, she's quite sarcastic in her appraisal of Ellen's work, and she's you know sort of raising a few questions, which you know I think readers will be raising on their own. But just in case they don't, then she's there to sort of nudge you into just you know ever so slightly questioning what Ellen's saying, because that's one of the great things about a book within a book. You've got a character who is very committed to their story and um, may have may or may not have an agenda that you don't know about, but they are controlling every bit of information that you get. And that's very different from, you know, the the author taking that role. So Ellen's in charge here um, up to a point. It's always so interesting to me when I'm reading memoirs, because I do think in the case of this fictional memoir or other memoirs that are out in the world, you really are learning about everything that's happening from the point of view of the person telling you the story. So sometimes I'm thinking, did that really happen? Or did they remember it exactly the way it happened? Or, you know, however they're putting themselves, I think, in the best light. And of course, in this situation, you write Ellen's memoir the way you write it on purpose. But it's just one of those interesting things to think about when you're reading a memoir. I think it really is. And I'm really intrigued by that. And, you know, it's that whole idea that you know, no two stories are the same. And the, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. And actually, when I conceived the, the story, and when I was plotting it initially, I thought that the whole thing would be Ellen's memoir, with these, you know, useful little interludes by the sarcastic journalist in the Sunday Times. But after, a, you know, quite, quite soon into the writing, I, you know, I just realized this was not going to work, that we had to have another entry point into this story to see what was true and what wasn't. And so, you know, Vic is a co-narrator. We we hear from him. He's Ellen's ex-partner and the father of Lucas. And we um, we get to hear from him after a little while. But initially, I hadn't conceived of doing that. And so it, it just shows that, you know, after 15 novels, I still am learning on the job. Because, you know, when you try something new, you, you know, it's quite rare for it to go seamlessly first time. And so, um, so I did have to rethink quite 
you know, in, in quite a, a major way once I'd started writing, which, which was quite unusual. But I'm really glad because, you know, as it turned out, it, involving Vic as a co-narrator really helps, you know, sort of fill the gaps in Ellen's own story. Absolutely. And that was one of the questions I had for you. Did you have every twist and turn plotted out or did some come to you as you wrote and how the format came about? So you kind of answered the format part of it, but did you have everything else plotted out? Are you a pantser or a plotter? I'm a plotter generally, but I try to keep an open mind because I have found that good ideas do strike. And then there's a you know period of exhilaration when you think, oh my God, this is a stroke of genius. I'm going to change everything. And then usually, you know, having slept on it, I'll think, is this more trouble than it's worth? I'm actually quite far down the line here. And, you know, even the tiniest detail that changes radiates out. You know, if you change um, someone's birthday or, you know, something happens on a Monday and, it, you know, initially you, you thought it was going to be a Saturday. It's incredible how problems radiate from a tiny change. So to introduce an unexpected twist, just because it's, you know, you've had that light bulb moment, you know, it's not, it, it's, it's not to be taken lightly. I'll have to think it through and see if it, if it works. So in this case, the twists and turns were planned. I usually start with the crime or the, you know, the moral dilemma that's at the heart of the book. And in this case, there is criminal activity. And so I had all of that plotted out. I had who done it, how they did it, what happened afterwards you know, all researched before I got underway. And um, it's not a spoiler to, to let everyone know that in the very first scene, Ellen, who is a, you know, civilized 40 something lighting designer, she's on a job with a client and um, in a you know very posh and historic part of central London. And she looks out the window and on the roof terrace, she sees Kieran, who is um, Lucas's friend, who, who I, I mentioned earlier. And um, she can't believe her eyes because, you know, she thinks he's an apparition. It, it can't be him. She knows it can't be him. And within a few pages, she has admitted it can't be him because he's dead. And she knows he's dead for a fact because she killed him. So, yes, it's I knew right from the start that I was going to open with that scene, that kind of, you know, it's almost a kind of classic noir thing of looking out the window and just happening to be at the window at the at the that very moment when the wrong person appears in your eyeline. And this is exactly what happens if she hadn't been at that client's flat on that day, just as he went out on his roof terrace, she would never have known that he was still there in London, alive in her life. And, you know, of course, from a, from a reader's point of view, I'm, I'm very much hoping that they'll be saying, hang on, she seems like quite a nice lady. She's professional. She's got a good job. She's bantering nicely with her client what's what's she doing admitting to having murdered someone you know what what on earth has happened to make this you know middle class um apparently um well-heeled woman with a happy family as far as we know what what on earth has happened to to make to get her involved in you know the worst possible kind of crime it was a great hook i was like okay i have to know more and the other thing, and I don't think this is a spoiler, that I like that you included, after she thought she saw Kieran there and she's trying to decide if it's him or not, at some point in the story, you talk more about how she thought she'd seen him elsewhere and it never was him. Because I think that's something that the human mind does a lot. And if there's someone out there, not necessarily someone you've killed, but someone that, you know, <laughs> you, <laughs> you have, I don't know what it is, you miss them, they've passed away, whatever, you think you see them, you know, kind of regularly. And so... I liked that you had her seeing him elsewhere as well and that those had not played out because then you're really doubting. Did she see him? Did she not see him? I thought that was great. Yeah. And then, of course, when she reports what she's seen to Vic, you know, he dismisses it in, in exactly that way. I think it's, it's very much, a, you know, a, a characteristic of grief, um, not to give too much away about why, why she's grieving, but, you know, it, it, it's a post-traumatic thing. And, you know, I think when we lose a loved one or, you know, even if it's, a you know, the, the ending of a relationship and, you know, nothing terrible has happened to anyone in, in, the, in the picture, I think you can sort of think you see someone. And I do it quite a lot, actually, when I, you know, I might be on a bus or a train and I'll see someone and I'll think it's someone that I used to know. And, you know, you, you almost kind of go rigid with the shock of it because it's so real. And then later I'll be like, 
oh, actually, it couldn't have been them because that was what he looked like 25 years ago and he would be 50 now. So, you know, that person I've just seen on the bus was, in fact, you know, just someone who looked like a young him. And so it has a lot. And, you know, they say we do all have doppelgangers and, you know, there, there are, there, there's room to doubt that feeling. And, you know, one of the things that I'm exploring in this book is, you know, this just certainty that Ellen has that she is right. And, you know, we meet these people and they will not budge from their conviction. And she absolutely will not. No one can persuade her that anything different has happened from the story she has she has accepted as the truth. And this underpins everything. So it doesn't matter who tells her she's imagining things in her sighting of Kieran Watts. She knows it's him. So, yeah, there's a there's a lot going on. There's a lot of layering in this book, I think. And there's a lot for for readers to to get their teeth into, you know, what's real, what's true? Do we trust her? Is she relatable? Or is she crazy? I'm in a, you know, sort of um, fortunate position to know how readers have responded in, in the UK where the book is already out. And I've been both surprised and relieved by the reaction to Ellen, which is is very favourable. I thought people would think she was an absolutely, you know, lunatic, you know, far <laughs> too far too overprotective of her children, you know, crazy. But interestingly, parents really relate to her. And they're like, oh, I could I could see myself having exactly those feelings in that situation. Maybe not acting on them. Maybe that's the different. Maybe that's what fiction does. Fiction is the acting on, you know, impulses and, um, you know, knee-jerk emotions that we all feel. And fiction lets us see what would happen if you actually, you know, did something about it. And that certainly sort of sums up what this book is. I think it's, you know, a parent acting out a monstrous overreaction to a terrible situation. That is so funny that you say that about Ellen, because my very next question was, I was going to talk with you a little bit about Ellen, because I found myself vacillating between really sympathizing with her (laughs) And then at times being like, oh my gosh, woman, let's get it together. But I really did over and over again. As a parent, I have three teenagers. Oh my goodness. I kept thinking I could see where she could do some of this. And then I thought, does that make me insane? So, you know, it was one of those (laughs) things that I really did kind of feel and understand what she was going through some of the time. And the other thing it really made me think about, is I think there's so much to unwrap in this book. There are so many layers and so many things to think about in sort of everyday life, but how much power we have over our children and how much influence others have. And that was the thing that I kept thinking about with Kieran. How would I have acted if I had a child that brought this person home that clearly seemed, I don't know, diabolical is too strong, but like unsettling or maybe that everything wasn't working like it should be? It's really a difficult thing. It really is. Generally, I think in the UK and in the States, we're very, very close to our kids. We've got a much closer, almost intimate parenting style compared to, you know, the one that we experienced growing up. And, you know, there's so much social engineering, isn't there, in the in the friendships? You know, you can, when they're young, you can arrange the play dates, you decide their activities, you're, you know, sort of, we're sort of doing everything with them and, you know, living their lives if not for them, then we're kind of, we're we're living alongside them. You know that kind of hearts beating as one. But there comes a time, inevitably, usually around the teenage years, maybe a little bit earlier, where they no longer want our presence. They don't need their little friend by their side. They don't want their mum doing their social diary and saying who's coming over after school. And so, you know, it's a real shock to someone like Ellen, who has, you know, she's got a few psychological issues anyway and she's quite controlling you know to her it's it's extraordinary and it happens quite late in Lucas's childhood that he simply doesn't need her anymore and he's making his own choices about friends and the one he's chosen is Kieran and Kieran is as far as Ellen is concerned the last person she would have chosen and then you have this kind of complicating issue that he's a socially disadvantaged boy. He's a, a foster child. Her son, Lucas, has been chosen by the school to buddy him because he's such a nice guy. And so, you know, she's proud of that. But the moment she meets Kieran, there's this kind of, you know, guttural antipathy. And he seems to feel it as well. And, it, you know, this was what I was really interested in, 
initially was this kind of, you know, because sometimes we meet people and we just know we dislike them and they dislike us. And, you know, it doesn't happen that often, but this is one of those cases. And, you know, so that horrible double whammy of, of her meeting someone who she loathes and she knows he loathes her and it's going to be a, a really rocky ride. But it, he's actually taking her place in, in her son's affections. And so it's horrible. I mean, it it is like a worst case scenario. Even if you think she's overreacting to Kieran and he's not that bad, it's still, you know, a horrible thing to have your, your, you know, beloved child withdraw from you. And, you know, it's a tough thing in parenting, isn't it? When you have to step back and, and let them be independent. But from her point of view, in this situation, she sees him throwing away everything. You know, he starts partying, he's doing drugs. He was going to be applying to Oxbridge. Suddenly he's not getting the grades for any university. He's simply not fulfilling his potential and and she knows who's to blame for that. It's that loss of power, I think. This this is a particularly interesting age to write about. And I'm and I've written I'm writing about it in a new project actually. And it is, you know, these are young adults and you simply can't control them or punish them in a way that you might consider doing for a younger child. They don't really care what we think. <laughs> <laughs> no, I th- I think that's exactly right. And like I said, I don't know what it says about me, but I just sometimes wanted to be like, come on, Ellen, get in there and do something. But I think you're exactly right. And plus, it makes a story yeah. better when she does it. So I mean, I, I get it. But I just at times wanted to kind of shake her a little bit and be like, come on. It, unfortunately, I couldn't really do that, that, you know, blow by blow, because I had to move things on. And it, we really just got the in fact, she says herself, you must, you know, as to her reader, she says, you must think I was obsessed with Kieran. But I'm only telling you the scenes that involve him. That, you know, there were other parts to our lives, but, you know, this book is concerned with Kieran Watts and the scenes involving him are the ones I'm going to tell you about. So we don't really see those bits in between and, you know, maybe a little bit from Vic later, but it's all about Kieran. He, she's obsessed and, um, and her book is about him. It's not about the, the other bits when probably she was a bit more normal. <laughs> <laughs> But I also think that's what makes it a good book. I mean, if I'm sitting here reading about this character, identifying with her, but also kind of mad at her saying, why didn't you do this? I mean, that that to me is a great story because you're in the midst of it all kind of thinking, oh, it would have gone better for you if you'd done such and such. You know, I I think that all makes the book. I think it does. And it's and it's such a key part of, of suspense and domestic noir, that idea of don't do that. You know, you're practically kind of looking through your fingers saying, oh, if only they'd called the police when it first happened. Or why didn't you just close the door? Or why didn't you just, you know, sort of turn away and never speak to that sinister stranger again? I mean, there's always that moment, isn't there, where you know what they should have done, and they just make that first mistake. And then their their path is is sort of set. And and I think that's that is a part of the genre. It really is, because if they were acting in a commonsensical, rational way. I don't think the story would develop in the same way. And on that note, um, regular readers of mine will know how often I use phobias and my characters will often have a phobia. And, um, and Ellen indeed has a phobia. And the reason I love them is that they make you act irrationally because they are irrational fears. And so they make you react to situations and develop these kind of safety behaviors that a rational person wouldn't do. And so it, it, it means that it, it can lead the story in different, more frightening directions. Absolutely. I was actually so interested when you introduced the phobia, and I figured that was going to be a part of the story. Let's talk a little bit about that phobia. Is it a real one? It is real. Yes. It's, it's a, I guess, you know, sort of we can loosely say it's a form of vertigo in that it involves a fear of heights. But it's not vertigo. Its name, it's, it's a kind of sub, sub phobia. In fact, I think it's, it's strictly speaking a condition rather than a phobia. But it's called high place phenomenon. The French call it l'appel du vide, call of the void. And I actually have this phobia quite often with my phobias. I'm having to imagine how they feel, but this is one that I actually have. And so what it involves is when you're at, on a high place, so um, an open high place, so it could be the edge of a cliff or on a bridge with, you know, kind of a low railing, 
or a roof terrace, as mentioned earlier in, in the Heights, or a rooftop, or even an open window where, you know, the frame is quite low and you're quite high up, you get the urge to jump. And you are not suicidal and you, you know, you could be perfectly happy. It's completely irrational. It's a kind of intrusive thought. And it's saying to you, if you just took a step, you you could kill yourself, you could die. And I've always had it. I think I first had that feeling as a child on a trip to the seaside on a pier. And at the end of the pier, I thought in a, in half, in a split second, I could just leap over and jump and I'd probably die. I still remember wow. having that feeling. And um, it's been so interesting talking about it, um, you know, sort of um, in relation to the heights, because quite a few people have it. I'd say, you know, this isn't a scientific bit of data, by the way, but I I think there's a, probably about one in 10 people seem to have it. And it has little other elements that people recognize. For instance, the, it sounds so crazy, but it's true. But it, say you're walking over a bridge, and I'm constantly walking across the Thames over different bridges. You have the urge to throw your bag into the river. Really? Yeah, it's like it's a self-destructive urge. <laughs> you hold on really tight and you walk down the middle of the bridge and people are like, lady, you're in the middle of the road. You're like, it's okay. Yeah. I can't be on the side. <laughs> it's so crazy, but it's quite terrifying because it's not you. Right. It's not it's not part of anything else. It's like it's an intrusive thought. But, you know, I'm, I'm living proof that you can just get on with your life. I don't tend to do things like go up to the top of a lighthouse or, you know, if someone's if, if a friend suggests a walk along, you know, the, the cliffs of Dover, which is where Ellen happens to be brought up, these, you know, enormously high cliffs where you can get quite close to the edge. And, you know, there's a famous suicide spot there, actually. I would never go on such a hike. I don't tend to put myself in um, the situation where I might be tempted. But it, it is it is extraordinary. So it's called high place phenomenon. She has this, and as you can imagine, having having set up the story as, as I just did, you know, the next step is for her to go up to this flat where she thinks she's seen Kieran reincarnated and discover if it's really him. But for her, that involves you know this this extra jeopardy of overcoming you know this fear she has. It it is going to take a lot to get her out on a roof terrace. Was that interesting for you, Louise, writing about this condition that you have? Yeah, absolutely. It was It was a really good form of therapy, really, I suppose. But it also meant that I could describe the feelings quite easily, you know, without, without needing to do any research for once. <laughs> well, that is nice. Exactly. You're like, I, I'm living this. All I have to do is jot it down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let, me, let me just do some method writing here. Um, yeah, it was it was really interesting because I know how debilitating these things can be. And, you know, in our house, I don't know if you remember Bram, one of the main characters, he has this, you know, extremely severe fear of being put in prison, um, which is called carcerophobia, another, you know, quite minor phobia. And that informs every single one of his wrong decisions in our house. And so I just I do find phobia. I have huge amounts of compassion for people who suffer from phobias. I completely get it. And but for an, a, a writer of thrillers, it is it's a perfect tool for setting things in motion that you know a, a normal rational Zen like person <laughs> probably wouldn't wouldn't do. It is. It's a very good tool for that. And you just mentioned our house, which is another one of your books that I just loved. And it's being adapted for television. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. It's already there in post-production, actually. So um, filming was last August, September time. July, August, September, they were, they were filming here in London, in South London, where the book's set. And um, yes, it's going to be on our screens here um, later this spring. And I'm not sure about North America yet, but I will let, let readers know as soon as I know. But yeah, it's so exciting. The cast is phenomenal. There's um, Martin Compton, who Line of Duty fans will know. Huge, huge A-list star here. He plays Bram. And then Tuppence Middleton is Fee. And she, um, for those who don't know her, she was in Sense8 and Downton Abbey. And she was recently in Mank, the great movie about the writing of Citizen Kane. She's 
very because she's got a kind of Audrey Hepburn vibe actually she's so elegant and naturally stylish and beautiful and a stunning actress she's a great fee and fee's very much at the heart of our house she's in most of the scenes and again for those who haven't read the book it opens when fee comes to her um, to her street after a few days away she's estranged from Bram her husband but they have this beautiful, extremely valuable family home that they still own together. And she um, comes down the street and as she approaches her house, she sees a removals van outside and all kinds of furniture being, being you know, sort of carried into her house. And she goes up and says, well, what's going on here? And she assumes Bram's, you know, moving in a friend or something. And it turns out that another couple have bought their house and she no longer owns it, and she knew nothing about it, and she didn't consent. But the whole thing has been legally done, um, and it's basically a, a property theft. Um, and so that's how the book opens. You know, is it's not my imagination; it is a real crime that has taken place. I mean, it is my imagination as well. <laughs> I've, I've put it in a in a family setting, but that kind of attempted fraud and house theft is extremely common. So yes, there'll, there'll be a, a real um, helping of property terror on our screens very soon. And I really hope you get to see it in the US. I think you'll love it. It's so stylish. It's, I went to the set a couple of times. It was all quite difficult because we had the COVID restrictions then and um, you know, it was locked down. And so at one point I thought, oh, my God, this, you know, my book is being made into this massive TV show and I might not even be able to go and meet the actors. But I did get to go and um, everyone was lovely. And it was just fascinating to, to see this house built on a set and, you know, imagined in such detail that, you know, it sort of looked better than I, I had described it and pictured it. Everything was just that bit more glamorous. And indeed, you know, of course, actors are just a bit younger and better looking than the original <laughs> characters. And it was just surreal, a surreal experience to go to the set and you know obviously a massive highlight in a in a writer's career and um, a few of my other books are, are also being developed so hopefully there'll be lots more lovely experiences like that and the heights has been optioned by a fantastic um tv production company here in the uk so you know i, I perhaps um this time next year there might be news to report on that but i think it will be a great one for the screen because it has that kind of hitchcockian vibe, not least because of the, you know, the, the vertigo element. Absolutely. Just everything about it, the characters, everything that unfolds, I think it would really do well on the screen as well. Thank you. Well, are you working on anything at the present that you'd like to share with me? <laughs> I am working on my next novel, which again, I think it's a kind of, you know, I, I was saying about each novel being a sort of reaction against the one that came before. And so this one is the first time I've got really gone back in time. In the Heights, obviously, we go back 10 years or so, maybe a little, yeah, about 10 years, I think, to, to get the backstory. But in my new book, which doesn't have a title yet, it's so new, we go back to the 90s, the 1990s. So half of the, the story is in the present day, and half is set in London in the mid 90s, which was the time of Cool Britannia. Britpop, Brit art, you know, Tony Blair coming into power. It was probably, you know, the heyday of, of London, I think, or at least, you know, since the 60s. And, um, and I was young then, I was in my early 20s, and it was really good fun to set part of the story then. And I'm sure that was a reaction against, you know, having done something very intense in the Heights and also having been you know, in lockdown and feeling so restricted, I really needed to take flight and I needed to sort of go back to, you know, al almost indulge in a bit of nostalgia. Although, you know, when, when people read it, they'll, they won't find it remotely nostalgic. It's quite dark and, <laughs> and quite bleak in, in, in a way, but it is a, it's a, it's more like the, my book, The Other Passenger, in that it's a um, deception thriller and quite noirish. But yeah, the, the scenes I've enjoyed writing the most are the ones set in the 90s. They live in Camden Town, which was a very trendy part of town then. I don't know if people remember the Primrose Hill set 
with Jude Law and oh, Sadie right. Frost and Kate Moss. And they were, you know, they were stone's throw from where my characters live. And, you know, all of the, the pubs played live music. And, you know, we had Blur and Oasis and not yet the Verve, actually. I think they came a little bit after 1995 when it's set. But yeah, it's um, so that's what I'm working on, which is great fun. And I'm also starting to write my first original TV screenplay. So there's there's a lot going on and um, it's going to be a very busy year, I think. It does sound like a very busy year, but a lot of wonderful things to be working on. Yes, definitely. It's It does feel like I'm at my career peak in my 50s, which I think is a, um, hopefully is an inspiration for um, for other writers who've been plugging away because I'm quite well known here for having taken a long time to take off. Um, I think Our House was really my first hit and, you know, the first one that won an award and has been made into, you know, option for TV, etc. And that was my 12th novel, I think. So I'd had a a long time of, you know, being disappointed before things took off. I feel like, you know, I have finally tipped, tipped into a world where it's exciting and, um, you know, projects get made and books reach an audience because ultimately that's, that's all you want as a writer. You know, you want to reach as many readers as possible. And, you know, it's heartbreaking when you put your heart and soul into a book and it sells a thousand copies or, you know, no one's heard of it or recommended it to their friends and no one's picking it for their book groups and no one's reviewing it. And so, you know, you, ultimately I just want to to reach more readers, entertain more people. Well, that's wonderful. And I always love to hear stories about that where, you know, people in their 50s and even 60s are really seeing their career take off. I mean, I know it's frustrating for you all those years of writing, but I'm very happy that it's going well for you now. Thank you so much. One of the questions I had for you, and we were talking a little bit about this before we started recording, was The Heights came out in the UK last summer, but it's just coming out for us in March. Does that normally happen with you or do sometimes your books come out in the UK and the US at the same time? It it varies. I think the ideal is to have a simultaneous publication and you can share all kinds of material and also you can just, you know, get the momentum. But it it didn't work out this time. And I can't even remember why, but, you know, nothing, nothing sinister, just a scheduling sort of decision. Um, but it does mean that I I will be stopping and starting with the character. So, you know, I've already done a, a whole publicity campaign um, last year about the heights. And then I, I broke off to do some writing and, and think about other projects. And so now I have to, you know, reread the book and remind myself of, of what happens. Because while I can remember the basic themes and talk in a very top line way, it's often the kind of, you know, the smaller details that make for an interesting sort of discussion. And um, I have been in, in situations that, you know, live events where it's very obvious that the readers know, know my book better than I do, <laughs> naming characters who I can't quite place in the story and, and you know, little, little twists and details. So, you know, but, but I don't mind that in a way, because I always say that, you know, when a, when a book's out there, it's no, it's no longer mine. It belongs to the reader. Their interpretation is just as valid as, as mine. And I'm, I'm always happy to, you know, discuss some of the more ambiguous things that pop up in the books where, you know, no one's right or wrong. I can say what I think might, might have happened and they can say what they think might have happened. But yes, so that's the difficulty is just getting back into the minds of the characters, remembering what they did, why they did it, even reminding myself of, you know, some of the more subplot details and yeah, just trying to give good value and not be, you know, hugely vague about something that I'm supposed to be a leading authority on (laughs) because I created it. Yes, a deer in the headlights look. You're like, hmm, give me about (laughs) 10 minutes while I try to remember who that is. (laughs) Yeah. And very well, it could have been COVID here. I know we've had so much disruption in the publishing industry and books being pushed back and scheduling issues. So it may just be that they thought they could get it out better with no printing issues now. Yes, I think actually what it was, was I changed publisher. And so oh. um, so the other passenger was the first of this new deal with, with my new publisher, Simon & Schuster, um, in the US. And, and so there was a delay because I switched publisher. So the other passenger came out a bit later, which meant that The Heights has come out a bit later as well. 
but it's we should we should be able to catch up with the next one so the 90s one hopefully i'll be able to to do all of my publicity in in one one fell swoop um but yes it's nice though because you know i as i say i have been in situations in the past where a book's been published it's been on the shelves for about a month and then you know it's flopped no one's bought it. No one knows about it. No one asks me a single question. So it's an absolute delight to to have round after round of interviews and events about the same book because, you know, ultimately you want them to, to endure and to, you know, to be read for years, not just in that kind of sweet spot when um, the reviews come out. You know, I'd like people to be reading The Heights in five years' time. And so, so I'm, I promise I'm not complaining. I also think that the world has gotten so much smaller that, you know, if, if people hear, if the book's coming out this March, people are talking about it all over the place on Bookstagram and Goodreads and different places, you can introduce it to a whole group of readers in the UK that maybe didn't see it when it came out. You know, I think there's so much more back and forth than there used to be. So spreading it out probably helps you. Yeah, absolutely. You're, at, you're, you're so right. Now, all kinds of I mean, books in the industry, we'd say backlist. I don't think readers think in that way. I don't think they think that a book that came out two years ago is backlist. But um, since that's what they are known as in the industry, you know, backlist titles are, you know, getting becoming huge hits again through TikTok and other social media. And, you know, there's always new ways of, of discovering new books. And now when you look at, you know, the US and the UK charts, you'll see such a smattering of older books because they found a new audience. And so, you know, that's definitely different and a fabulous thing. And also, you know, this golden age of TV adaptations of books is, is giving books a longer life. So Our House was published in the UK in 2018. It'll be on screens in 2021, which, you know, three years is actually not very long to go from book to screen. These projects can, can go on for decades. But it does help give a book a longer life. And, you know, it all began with ebooks, I guess, where, you know, you can, there's it just the lines have blurred between the big front list titles being talked about right now and good books of the, of the past. And I love that. I love looking at, the, you know, the Kindle Top 100 and seeing George Orwell next to Lisa Jewell or Stephen King. It's just, it's fabulous. I agree completely. It's really fun to see some of those older books continuing to have a longer life. And as you said, I think all these screen adaptations really help with that as well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, on the subject of books, what have you read recently that you really liked? I have read two that I'm going to mention. And one I know is out because it's a New York Times bestseller right now. And that is The Maid by Nita Prose, who also happens to be an amazing publisher in Canada. And this book is so charming. I guess you'd call it cozy crime. The maid is Molly, who works in this sort of plush, old, traditional hotel. And one of the guests of the hotel, Mr. Black, is killed in his suite and she discovers the body. And so, um, you know, this sort of mystery unfolds. And I think you can, you can gather from his name, Mr. Black, that there's a, almost a Cluedo sort of feel to this book. It's a really well-constructed mystery but also Molly uh, it, it has this fantastic voice that's you know not unlike a sort of Eleanor Oliphant type voice she's got a very sort of quirky take on everything and doesn't you know doesn't quite see the world in the way that all of the other characters do so she's a really sort of charming guide um, and you really root for her so I really recommend that that's great that's The Maid by Anita Prose. And then I've also just read um, the new Lucy Foley, which I'm not sure when your interview is going to be aired, but it, I think it's out around the same time as The Heights, so probably good, good timing. And it's called The Paris Apartment by Lucy Foley. And I absolutely love her, um, her mystery stories, her thrillers. There's three of them now. This one takes us to Paris and an old, one of those gorgeous old apartment buildings with the sort of central courtyard and the concierge and, um, you know, a cast of mysterious characters. The narrator is, is called Jess and she is, um, you know, this broke Brit who's turned up to try and blag a stay with her, her brother who she, you know, they were brought up in different families and so she doesn't know him that well. 
But, you know, now's a good time for her to um, get to know him better because she's, you know, running away from something in the UK. But she arrives at the apartment building to find that he's gone. He's not there. He's mysteriously disappeared. And, you know, his wallet is there. It doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem like he's, he's gone off on a job or anything. It seems like something, you know, sort of odd has happened. But all of the, the residents in the building are acting a bit odd and being quite guarded and secretive. And so they're no help at all. But gradually, she starts to unravel the reason why he's disappeared and this sort of bigger mystery that the residents are involved in. So it's so atmospheric. She writes beautifully about places and, you know, really evokes, you know, very rich sense of, of Paris. And, you know, that kind of apartment living where everyone has to kind of rub along together, but they might not otherwise have much in common. So I really recommend that too. Yeah. I loved that book. And definitely the atmosphere makes it. You just felt like you're dropped right in the middle of that apartment building. It was just phenomenal. Both yours and hers are probably my two favorite thrillers so far of 2022. Thank you so much. And they're both set partly in, in apartments. So, um, you know, and have that kind of what you what you can see from the window sort of element, which is, you know, as we were saying earlier, is that kind of classic trope. And it really does work. I mean, we've all stood at the window and watched someone or, you know, been just a little bit nosy. I mean, obviously, authors are, are naturally very curious. But yeah, I think I think both the Paris Apartment and the Heights have that idea of, you know, being in in being at the wrong window at the wrong time and seeing something that puts you in danger. And you both include twists and turns that could happen, but are really well done, like things I didn't see coming, but I wasn't like, oh, that would never happen. Instead, they're just very well crafted, which I loved. Thank you so much. I think that, you know, I mean, I know, I know, Lucy, we're mutual fans. And I think we do both try and take traditional forms and, you know, kind of do something original with them. And I think, you know, that's what good psychological thriller writers are doing and good, good um, suspense writers are doing. You want those traditional elements, but you, you want to surprise with some new themes and some, you know, some unexpected paths. And Lucy just does it so instinctively. I think she's a brilliant writer. Well, I'm glad that you liked that one. And I'm glad we got to talk so much about the heights. I just really appreciate your time, Louise. And I'm glad you came on the Thoughts from a Page podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great fun to chat. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. If you liked this episode, and I hope you did, please follow me on Instagram at Thoughts from a Page. Consider joining my Patreon group to access bonus content. Tell all of your friends about the podcast and rate it or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts. I would really appreciate it. The book discussed today can be purchased at the Conversations from a Page bookshop storefront, and the link is in the show notes. I hope you'll tune in next time. Hear Her Sports is a podcast for everyone who loves stories by and about women striving to improve and make a difference in their lives. I am your host, Elizabeth Emery, a former professional cyclist. In every episode, I introduce a female athlete or woman in the business of sport through a thoughtful conversation about who they are and the terrific work they're doing. My guests and I explore the glorious and frustrating issues in sports, history, equity, training, nutrition, and so much more. Join us for inspiration, for community, and for love of being a strong athletic woman.